John Knight, Lone Wolf, by Shaquille Smith. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. A nursery rhyme that is supposedly the secret to life. The information, plus the perspective, gives us its true reality. The individualities that shape everyone's path through life and its choices allow them to continue on that path or crash and be ductile. Was it worth it as you look at the river's end? John's father left this note and a family heirloom the day he died. His mother had also passed a week before. For John, that thin thread that holds sanity together has become even thinner. Chapter 2. Friends of Enemies Are Enemies The sound of footsteps and chattering outside the room fade away as John scans the folder's contents. It contains a list of names and locations of several kids across Chicago and out of state. More importantly, the list includes a record of past abductions and planned future ones. John's hands shake as he goes through the details about the next operation at the U.S.-Mexican border, where many children will be trafficked. He flips through the papers and notices the header printed at the top of each page. Tenpress Foundation, which seems to be the head of the organization behind all of these abductions. Why these specific kids? John mumbles. He turns the pages only to stop at the details given in the last few pages. The children listed were born with an immense amount of energy. The organization harvested and sold the organs of these children to the highest bidder. John feels hot bile rise up in the back of his throat as his thoughts rage in his mind. As John flips yet another page of the bulky folder, he hears footsteps heading towards the office door. He doesn't hesitate and pushes the folder into the folds of his jacket before heading for the window. The moment the chief enters the office, John has disappeared. John is driving away by the time the chief notices that his secret compartment has been rummaged through. John doesn't bother taking off his shoes or jacket as he enters his house. He sinks into the living room couch and places the folder on the table. He opens it and tries to get a hold of his scattered thoughts. He stops breathing when he spots his daughter's name on the list. He feels sweat on his fingertips and his heart thundering in his chest. He's overcome with so much grief that a strangled cry escapes his lips and then he's screaming. At that moment, he wishes that he could unsee what he saw. He wishes to forget, to ease the pain that threatens to consume him. He heads for the liquor cabinet, rummaging to get his hands on the strongest drink without paying heed to the bottles that topple over and crash on the floor. He chugs alcohol, taking solace in how it burns going down his throat. Drunk John staggers towards his daughter's bedroom, left untouched since the day she disappeared. Memories poke at John's mind, and he recalls the old days when he was a proud detective and a proud father. He stops at the threshold of his daughter's room and inhales. Her smell is almost gone, and dust has covered every inch of the room. Still, he has no heart to touch anything. His eyes land on her chest, her secret stashing place. John forces his steps towards it. Holding back a sob, he opens it to find the family heirloom sitting right where she had placed it the night of her birthday. He picks it up gingerly and carries it to the living room. He places it in front of him as he reaches for another bottle. John keeps on drinking, having no strength to go through the folder once more. Maybe he'd find more details, and perhaps he won't. 
He finishes one bottle after the other until he can't think straight and has to lie down. His eyes feel heavy and his thoughts muddled. Before he knows it, he's falling asleep. John's eyes snap open to the sound of a loud bang. He jumps up from the couch to find his living room door knocked down and military men entering. They throw in a smoke grenade, making John's eyes burn and water. He holds his breath and covers his nose with his jacket as he overturns the living room couch and hides behind it. The military men don't hesitate and open fire. Their bullets rain down on everything John holds dear, splintering the picture frames that hang on the wall, vases he bought with his wife, and his daughter's stuffed toys that are still all over the place. John clenches his jaw as he reaches for the documents he'd splayed on the living room table the night before. Once collected, he shoves the folder and the heirloom into his jacket. Then he reaches for the gun hidden beneath the couch just for such moments. Without hesitating, John opens fire on the military force and taking advantage of their momentary urge to protect himself, he rushes for the bedroom. He locks the door behind him and reaches for a key inside the nightstand drawer. He opened a hidden door tucked away inside of his walk-in closet. He opens the door, revealing a showcase of guns he'd secretly stashed ever since he returned from the Vietnam War. He could hear the footsteps of the men coming down the hallway. John pulls out an M60, quickly loads it, and open fires. They hide in the hallway with a cry of alarm, giving John enough time to pack away an AK-47 and a couple of loaded magazines, plus a knife the size of a toddler's arm. He's almost to the window when they start firing inside the room. A sudden stab of pain makes John curse. He knows he's shot, but wastes no time hoisting himself onto the window ledge. He jumps down from two stories high, and his feet land on the hard ground. Soon, he is up on his feet and running. The military men let out a cry of alarm as they rush towards the window with their guns at the ready. They let out a string of obscenities when they find that John has disappeared, leaving nothing behind, not even a few drops of blood. John doesn't take his car. Instead, he staggers down the street and toward the underground tunnels that might be the only hiding place from the men who'd barged into his house. People throw him curious and alarmed glances when they notice the blood that now covers the front of his shirt. Some eye the black bag he carries close to his chest, the one hiding the guns. John's mind whirls as he increases speed. Who were these men? He asks himself as none of them seem familiar to him. None of them were from his precinct. Did the government send them because of the intel he has, he wonders? But he has no evidence to support his doubts. For now he's sure of one thing, that he holds valuable information, and the attack could have come from anywhere. Soon he finds himself turning into a blind alley and heads for the manhole cover. With great difficulty he pulls it up and steps into it. He closes the cover to the sirens wailing in the streets above. John keeps on walking in the dark tunnel. His thoughts are a mess, and his body is aching. Finally, John reaches an open space that is cleaner, and air from the vent fresher. He slumps against the wall and bites back a curse at the throbbing pain in his shoulder. Only then does he dare to look down and notice that he's been shot. Clenching his jaw, he pushes his shirt collar to reveal the wound. He sighs in relief when he realizes that the bullet has only grazed his skin. He lets his head rest against the concrete wall behind him and closes his eyes. At once his daughter's face appears behind his closed eyelids. No matter how hard he tries, he can't forget the sound of her laughter, her toothy grin, and her baby smell. He recalls his wife's laughter, too, the touch of her lips on his cheek, and the last time she'd greeted him on the day of their daughter's birthday. He misses them so terribly. He wishes he could have done more for them, 
Regrets threaten to drown him as he recalls all of the important events he'd missed throughout the years. He wonders if his wife and daughter are ever going to forgive him. The sound of water flowing through the tunnels and the droplets falling on the hard ground pull him out of his memories and he begins to observe his surroundings. The tunnel is dark and there is no one following him. This experience reminds John of his time in the Vietnam War. There was a time when he'd been pinned down in a tight spot by a famous Vietnamese sniper. He'd stayed hidden in a confined space for hours or, or days. He, he can't remember still. He remembers counting his breaths and minutes, but eventually he lost track. Once relaxed, John dozes off. His soft snores echo in the dark tunnels before he jolts awake again. He rubs his face and tries to move his shoulder. It hurts way less than before, and the blood has stopped seeping out of the wound. Leaning against the wall, he tries to make sense of his location. The precinct is his destination. Thanks to his job, he has the map of the tunnels memorized. John walks through the tunnels for two miles and down to an alley that is quite close to the precinct. He waits for a nightfall and for the flurry of activities to die down at the police station. Once it's quiet, he pushes the cover of the manhole aside and climbs out. Without making a sound, he covers his tracks and finds himself at the back of the chief's office again. He closes his eyes. He stands pressed against the wall beside the window he used to sneak in the last time. John peeks into the office through the broken window and finds the office empty. The chief's cigar rests on the ashtray, smoke still hanging thick over it. It's evident that the chief has just stepped out of the office and will be back. John pushes open the window and enters the office, ignoring how his sixth sense tells him that this might be a trap. John sits down in the chief's chair and puts his gun in his lap, waiting for the chief's return. He doesn't move when he hears the heavy footsteps coming toward the door or when the handle turns. The chief enters, looking down at some papers in his hands. He misses John sitting in his chair entirely. He's crossed half of the room when he looks up and stops dead in his tracks. J John! What? Hell! The chief can't form coherent words. In the lamp's light, John can see perspiration forming on the chief's forehead and how the papers shake in his hands. For a moment, the chief tries to retreat, but then stops, recalling that he's the chief, John's superior. What are you doing here? Without a word, John points his gun at the chief and points it toward the visitor's chair facing his. Sit down, chief. Let's have a chat. I don't think I need to tell you that if you make a single noise, so much as a squeak to alert the others, I'll blow your brains out. The chief lets out a nervous chuckle and, and makes his way toward the chair. Once he's in the chair, John leans forward and looks him right in the eye. Tell me, how come you were in possession of this? John throws the folder in front of the chief. The chief looks down at it for a moment and then looks up at John. I don't know what this is, the chief replies, loosening the top button of his shirt. He's nervous and scared, but trying to play it cool. John grins mockingly. It was in your office. Tell me, what's the Tenpress Foundation? Why are your monsters abducting children? The chief doesn't reply, frustrating John. He stands up and pushes the chair back. It hits the back wall with a loud thud, making the chief jump in his chair. John makes his way around the table and perches on its edge just a few inches away from where the chief sits. I'm going to ask you one more time 
and then I'm going to enjoy cutting you into pieces. Tell me everything you know. The chief clenches his jaw and looks up at John with defiance in his eyes. At that moment, John knows with certainty that the chief is one of the people behind this. He does everything to keep standing upright, not to reach out and claw the man's face. How can he? I can't tell you anything more than you've already read, the chief replies calmly. It appears that the chief is going to take all his secrets to the grave. John lets out a chuckle and reaches for the duct tape on the chief's table. He begins to tape the chief's mouth, forcefully wrapping the tape around the back of his head, covering his mouth, drowning the sound of his protests. John pulls his knife out, looking the chief fiercely in the eyes. Don't say that I didn't warn you. Without hesitation, John chops off one of the chief's ears. Blood splatters everywhere, and the chief's muffled cries echo in the quiet of the room. But John is blind with rage. All he sees is the bloated body of his daughter and the names of countless other children on the list. Once the chief stops wailing, John pulls off the duct tape. The chief cries out in pain and doubles over with tears slipping down his cheeks. Now, I'm going to ask you to tell me what the hell you know about the file. If you don't answer, we can always chop off other parts of your body. John grins maniacally and runs his eyes down the chief's body. John cuts a small hole into the duct tape over the chief's mouth to allow the chief to speak. The chief shudders before he starts talking. Uh, uh, I don't know much, I swear. I, I did what I was ordered to do, and I didn't have a choice. Not helpful. I need names. Who else is in on it with you? I swear, I don't know, John. All of us are puppets following orders. John clenches his jaw and shakes his head. This is not getting us anywhere, Chief. Who gives orders? Who? Please, please, the chief starts crying, but it does nothing to soften John's heart. He picks up the knife and pushes it into the chief's temple, forever silencing the old man. John resists the urge to chop the traitor into bits, but he doesn't stop his hand as he turns to face him, slicing the chief's face up like a birthday cake. When he's done, he steps back and looks at his handiwork. It doesn't alleviate his rage. At the sound of laughter that echoes in the hallway outside, John finds himself making his way toward the door. How dare they laugh when they did nothing to help his daughter? His mind screams, but his lips are shut tight. He raises his gun and fires at the two police women chattering outside. They fall, eyes wide with palpable shock on their lifeless faces. John doesn't hesitate. He doesn't stop. The storm of his thoughts blind him, and the hunt ignites a fire in his heart that thrashes at his entire being. He wants to kill them all, the selfish bastards who had taken an oath to protect the citizens. Was not his daughter one such citizen? An innocent child who had yet to see the world? He wants to burn the entire building to the ground, full of deaf bastards who had not heard his cries for help and ignored his tears and desperation. They were supposed to be his comrades, his friends and saviors, damn it! John makes his way through the station lodging bullets into anything moving. He leaves a trail of bodies behind him, friends, colleagues who betrayed him. He doesn't spare the prisoners screaming for help in their cells or the janitor standing petrified in the hallways. They were all in it together, willingly or by turning a blind eye to what was happening. 
John stops outside the precinct building, drenched in blood. He turns to look at the building, at the flickering lights through the second floor window. He takes in the silence of the night and then turns for the manhole he emerged from. His work here is done. The rage leaves him breathless as John climbs down the manhole. The sound of sirens seem far away. The shouts of alarm and cries for help as the world finds out what has taken place at the precinct. John limps his way through the tunnels, back towards the clean space he'd rested for a while. He's tired. So tired. He needs rest. Maybe forever. But his daughter's face keeps him going. John slumps down against the wall, raising his hands in front of his eyes. They're coated with remnants of the bloodbath he'd initiated. He blinks, wishing the blood would disappear and his hands would come clean. He has killed innocent people, killed them without feeling remorse. The same ones who held his innocent daughter. What has he done? What has he done? He's becoming an animal, a monster. He pulls at his hair and screams in the quiet tunnels. Their terrified, surprised, and vacant eyes appear behind his eyelids, and he lets out a string of obscenities. Suddenly, John is exhausted. The guilt of killing the innocent is overwhelmingly strong. It claws at his senses, making him dizzy. His mind shuts down, and he welcomes the unconsciousness when it takes over. John doesn't find solace even in his slumber. His mind takes him back to another dark part of his life, his years in the Vietnam War. The sound of his bullet burying into the frail body of an innocent child still echoes in his mind in the darkest hours of his life. Once more he's revisited that scene. He looks into the terrified eyes of a child and then hears his angry voice demanding something the child is not able to understand. His memories show himself raising his gun and then watching a bullet burying right in the center of his eyes. John recalls looking down at the tiny, lifeless body and then picking up the bag the boy carried. He empties it over the dead body and hears books fall on the rough ground with a muffled thud. The gust of wind opens the book and flips through the pages as if desperately looking for answers John seeks, as if it wants him to leave the boy's body and his things alone. John remembers crouching down as something catches his eyes, words written in the rough handwriting of the child. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. When John reads the words, he waits for the sound of jets passing overhead and his comrades calling him, but it never happens. Instead, he turns to find the body of the little boy gone. Panic grips John, and he turns in circles to look for it. The scene dissolves right before his eyes, and he finds himself standing in a jungle. It's dark, but a little sunlight filters through the thick canopy of leaves above his head. The sound of animals reaches ears, and he inhales the smell of the forest. John knows he's dreaming, but the scene is too vivid for him. He slaps his arm to get rid of the strange fly that lands on his arm. He curses when he feels the sharp sting of the slap. A dream can't be this vivid. John startles when he hears a twig snap behind him. He turns to find himself looking right into the wild red eyes of a black wolf. Fear twists like a hot poker inside his stomach and he feels his muscles freeze. He can't seem to draw in a breath, and his lungs protest at the lack of oxygen. As he watches, 
the wolf opens its mouth to speak. Weak. 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 It snarls. It keeps repeating the words as John coaxes his limbs to move and get away from the wolf. He manages to move his left foot back when the wolf crouches. Within a blink of an eye, it jumps at John, and John jolts awake. He's breathing heavily and sweating profusely. His battered and bloody t-shirt has stuck to his body under his leather jacket. Cursing, he takes off the jacket. When cool air hits his clammy skin, he almost sighs in relief. But then his eyes land on the blood that covers his hands and shirt. He pushes himself to his feet and staggers to where the clean water flows. John calms his nerves as he washes away the blood from his shirt and skin. He urges himself to think, to plan his next steps. What he's done is already done. What's important is how he goes from here. John pushes away the memories of his inhumane massacre at the precinct and forces his mind to think of the next steps. Once refreshed, John starts towards another manhole. He knows that he'd appear in another part of the city where he'd be safe for a while. John knows that he should eat, even though he's been trained to last days without food. Right now, he needs to put something on his empty stomach to help him think better. Soon he arrives at the bottom of yet another manhole. He pushes his exhausted body up the ladder and emerges into a secluded alley. It's early in the morning, around seven, and birds chirp merrily. John tries to find solace in their sound, but his heart is too heavy to be at peace. Maybe he'll never be at peace again. He forces his body to turn towards the first cafeteria he comes across. He stops just outside its glass wall, looking at the display of assorted items. He monitors his surroundings carefully, noticing that no one is there. He might be far away from the precinct, but that doesn't mean he's safe. There's no one around, no police or the strange military men who had come after him. John almost relaxes, but then stiffens. His eyes land on the TV inside the cafeteria that is running the morning news. It shows his face, a picture they must have taken from his house. The reporter reads the breaking news. Breaking news. Precinct massacre suspect identified as Detective John Knight. Earlier today, he shot and killed his colleagues, including inmates and the janitorial staff. We have now gotten reports that Detective Knight has also been responsible for the kidnapping and murder of over 400 children here in Chicago. Sources also say that Detective Knight is responsible for his own daughter's death. Officers warn to avoid all contact and report anything that seems suspicious. The suspect is armed and Liars preach with persuasion just to keep up an image or facade underneath all the flaws. What's the cause just to be who you really truly are? Let me see. Behind the shadows, let me see just who you are for real. I know looks be deceiving, actions misleading, faulty intentions soon will show. Protect me from enemies, through the valleys of danger, beware of the energies, 
their lives they can change up the weapons that's formed can do no harm to me I still weather the storm and fear get ugly if it get ugly, could I still trust that you will hold it down? Cause honor is a must. Shoot me down, which you throw me under bus. Tank my image, sweep my feelings up with dust. Rather with the dirt, hit me with the hurt. Slander me with tongues, throw me till I'm numb. Look what it's become. Betrayal is a feeling. Poison through your veins, turns you to a villain. All I know is real. Really, I'm a realist. Don't fall for a pill. Many things appealing. Back to show reveal. I done been the witness, but I'm hoping still integrity will heal it. Don't take much to get it. Careful when you give it. Story is to pick the searching for the truth. See, you can't forgive it. Have you seen it different? Play with me, it's over. Can't restore the roof.